Hello, everyone, and welcome to Seriously Loco, the Seriously Crazy Fan Podcast for El Paso Locomotive FC, a proud member of the Beautiful Game Network and brought to you by Roughneck Scars and Icarus FC. I'm your host, Phil Baki, and uh, I'm joined tonight by my co-host, Mika Burrell. Mika, how are you doing? Doing well. Getting Loco continues. Yep, getting Loco <laughs> series well well underway. Um, and we're joined as well by my my co-host, Christian Canales. Christian, good to have you back. Yeah, man. I missed the last one, unfortunately. It would have been fun to to chat with, with uh, Sanupe. Unfortunately, I had other things going on. But uh, happy to be here for this one. We've got, a, we've got an exciting one here today. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, uh, and we're going to waste no time introducing our guest tonight, uh, and that is Nick Hines, one of the newest members of El Paso Locomotive FC. Nick, uh, thanks for joining the show tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. How uh, how have you been been finding El Paso so far? You know, you, <laughs> I know uh, off seasons can be a little bit weird. You you were you spent last season in Austin, so how are you finding El Paso? Yeah, El Paso is obviously different, completely different from what I'm used to. Obviously, living in Miami and and Seattle and Nashville, you know, there's you no know, bigger bigger cities, but you know, living in Austin gave me a little bit of that 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 texas look so it's it's i'm doing pretty well moving out here i feel good it feels feels like home that's that's uh that's good to hear yeah a little bit a little bit of a different vibe than yeah than nashville or (laughs) miami yeah first time that you're not you know dealing with humidity nick it's really dry here right yeah i know this is the first um city i've lived in that's not humid at all so (laughs) kind of scared for it but looking forward to it to see what it brings have you uh have you feel like you've been adjusting well to the (laughs) to like the altitude and the and the dry the dry uh climate out here yeah so as the days go on obviously training out there every day and you you're gonna get used to it over time but when i first got out here i was i was struggling a little bit but by the time the the season starts officially then we, we were ready to go yeah, fair enough. I uh, <laughs> feel like uh, the first time, and this is a while back, the first time I ever ran in El Paso, I, I was just asking myself where all the air was. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, so I, I I feel you on that. The uh, I guess we'll start out, obviously, there's going to be questions, you know, asking about how you fit into this locomotive team and how, how you're looking ahead mm-hmm. to the season. But I want to start out just getting to know you a little bit and, and getting to see, you know, Nick Hines, the person as well. And, um, you know, just look at, looking back, you, you were born in Kingston, Jamaica, right? So is that, so I was curious, like how early you came to the States and then what, you know, did your Jamaican heritage have any impact on your, on your, you know, kind of early um, upbringing as a footballer? Did that, did that have an impact on you? Yeah. So born in Jamaica, moved over when I was very young. I want to say like two, three years old. Um, And yes, growing up, it did have an impact on um, how I viewed the game because my dad um, also played for the Jamaican national team and played professionally in Jamaica. So he was kind of lecturing me on, you know, what, what I need to do and how I need to get better. So yeah, that kind of culture rose inside my household. Speaking of your dad, would you say that he's one of your kind of footballing idols or if not, who are some of the, the names in the game that, that you look up to? Yeah, so I always, when I was young, I always looked up to him because he was, you know, starting off, I was, I was a forward and he was a forward. So it was like, oh yeah, I wanted to be like him, you know, all the stories that he used to tell, I wanted to, you know, replicate all, everything he's told me. But growing up, um, I got switched to play left back and then I also, I fell in love with how Marcelo plays from Madrid. You know, he just shows his personality and his flair and he's always looking, looks like he's happy playing. So I always, I always looked at, looked up to that and I always loved that. That's really interesting, Nick, because I, you know, obviously when you signed, of course, we, you know, here at Seriously Loco, we do our deep dives and 
I've noticed you've got a bag of tricks on you and you like to take people <laughs> on. So I'm assuming that comes from watching Marcelo over the years. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, do you do you support Real Madrid or, or what club or clubs do do you support? Do no, you not a Real Madrid. <laughs> yeah, not not a Real Madrid fan. I'm a Chelsea fan. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. You're Love champions. Chelsea. Fair enough. Yes. <laughs> Love Chelsea. There you go. Cool. Yeah, Mika, we've been seeing a little bit of a mix, I feel like, because um, we yeah. we have a couple, we have an Arsenal, Emmanuel's an Arsenal supporter. Terrible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Mika's, Mika's club is Arsenal, so uh, yeah. so unfortunately, you guys are at odds on this one. Um, yeah. That's... <laughs> But no, yeah, fair enough with with Chelsea. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit. You know, obviously, we're going to talk about kind of your playing career and you coming up in the game. And I think I think Mika had a had another question along along those lines. Yeah, I noticed you played two seasons of NCAA soccer with the University of Akron, and you know, it's kind of a it's not something that you see a whole lot, I guess, um, as far as that that NCAA to professional pipeline, I feel like that's a harder track. So I'm wondering, Mm -hmm. did collegiate soccer actually prepare you to be a pro or did you find that the step up from that level of the game to professional football was like totally different? Um, I would say that my experience in my career, it helped me um, to go collegiately first because in the collegiate environment, it's more physical output. You know what I'm saying? So they really prepare you to dig deep when let's say we're doing fitness or, you know, a a hard training session or a drill or whatever, whatever it may be that it mentally you need to push through it because, you know, it's temporary pain and it's, and and the outcome of it is going to be a lot greater than, than what you think it is. And then, you know, bringing that kind of aspect into the professional environment, because I don't really teach you that per se in the professional environments or should be already known that you should be doing that kind of stuff. It helped me to progress faster and easier. Interesting. So you'd, you would say that the NCAA soccer is really more about like the physical aspects. What, what were the kind of like technical drills though? Did they do a lot of that work, a lot of video work, or it was mostly just really training? Yeah. So um, the physical aspect was a, little, a a tiny amount of what we all did at, you know, at the collegiate level. Obviously I went to the university of Akron, so it was more um, technical based. We okay. did a lot of technical training, We did a lot of video to assess the games that we've been in playing. And I don't know. I think that in my, in my environment at university of Akron, yes, there was a, the physical output side, but the technical side, we were a very possession based team. So we focused a lot on that stuff as well. And you guys were pretty successful, right? Back to back conference championships in in your time there. Yeah, back to back. And then my second year, we went to College Cup. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. But, you know, you're a Miami boy going up to Ohio. What was that <laughs> like? Have you ever played oh in the snow? Oh, my God. <laughs> Never played in the snow until I got to Ohio. <laughs> how was, and how is that? Because if you're a possession-based side, I assume the snow is stopping the ball in ways and making it bounce in ways that y'all were not happy with, right? Yeah, luckily it didn't snow too bad to where it obstructed our 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 play, but let me tell you it was the cold. I've never experienced something like that. <laughs> it's way <laughs> too cold out there. <laughs> well, I uh having just recently relocated uh to Ohio myself, I'm looking out at snow right now, unfortunately, and uh yeah. <laughs> Not not yeah. too happy about it. So, yeah, <laughs> so. Well, Nick, yeah you know exactly what I'm going through. <laughs> well, Nick, it's we call this the Sun City for a reason. You won't you won't see much of that here. So, um, yeah, thank it's God, a safe place. <laughs> 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 so you went from Akron to the Seattle Sounders Academy, right? And I'm curious, did your time 
in the Sounders Academy ever overlap with John's? Because we know John coached there for a bit. Yeah, so a little backtrack. I started in Miami at Kendall Soccer Club Academy, Kendall Academy in Miami. Right, right. And then made my transition over to Seattle Sounders Academy when I was 16, 17, and then went to Akron. And then yeah, went back to... I had to, it backwards. <laughs> that wouldn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and then after after Akron, I went back to um, Seattle Sounders 2. And that was when um, John Hutchison was, was the head coach for gotcha. the second team. So you yeah. you played under him like for... They were still S2, I think, right? Not yet Defiance. Yeah, they were S2. And I played for him for two years. And then Defiance... I believe, or I might have it mixed up. I think I played for for one or two years, and then right. they switched over the branding to Defiance, and yeah. Well, you're kind of in a unique position then among our squad because you're perhaps the only one who's actually played for John before. So what can you tell us about those two years and, and what he was like a, as a manager? Yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, love Hutch. Um, he obviously demands a lot of you know, energy and, and focus and, and all of that from all the boys, which is great because everyone, it gets everyone tuned in and training and stuff like that. Um, he likes to play aggressive attacking football, which is I, from playing under him, I can tell it's very beneficial in this league. Um, it's very hard to stop, very hard to counter counter press and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that, the brand of football that he's trying to bring out here, it will definitely fit the personnel we have. And, you know, in order to win championships and, and, and other accolades. With, uh, with your time out there at Seattle, um, how do you, what do you think, I guess, in terms of the thing that you got, in, in Seattle's Academy or in S2 that, that really armed you mm-hmm. to continue on into the professional ranks and, and get the move to, to Nashville that you got? Um, I think what really helped me was, you know, thankful to the Sounders organization for putting me through this process. But when I was um, in the Academy, I always got the opportunity to play up with S2 or train with the first team. So I see what it's like and that kind of environment of how clean and precise everyone is and how everyone's play is. So I feel like playing up and playing against a lot older experienced professionals at a very young age helped me progress and helped me clean up, you know, some of the things that, you know, a regular 17 or 18 year old won't do. So you, you get that move from Seattle to Nashville and obviously, you know, they, uh, they make the transaction. It seems like, it seems like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be in Nashville for a while. And then Mm -hmm. obviously like the loan, the loan move to, to Austin comes out. And I think we've talked with a couple of of the other players about, you know, everyone kind of starts to think of athletes as like, it's just a straight line progression and you start here and you just continue in a straight line that can be a little bit of a, like when there isn't a necessarily a straight line progression, it can feel like a little bit of a setback, but how did, how did you feel about your, about your move to Austin and how did you feel about your time there? Um, obviously every, everybody going from the MLS back to the USL, especially when they just get the call up to the MLS is going to look at it as, you know, a little setback. And at first I'm not going to lie. I did a little bit because I just, moved out there, just got everything settled. And then for me to move again was, you know, a little eye opening to me on, on what I needed to do. But then I also looked at it as opportunity that I'm going to be able to play, showcase my talent and, and just get better all around. And I mean, you obviously, you did end up playing a lot for Austin and ended up featuring really heavily in that, in that side last season. So um, when you look back on that season, um, how, how do you think it went? What, what did you, what did you really take away from that, that year out in Austin? Um, I think that the results obviously from the soccer perspective and the team perspective could have been a lot better than what we've hoped, but 
that team faced a lot of adversity from from the news of switching to a different city to getting new head coaches, you know, people moving around in the front office. And the fact that the guys in the locker room stuck together and still try to grind out wins and, you know, stuff like that is what I admire the most. So going, I know we're going backward through the career progression a little bit, but um, you you earned a few caps with the United States U-20 team. Uh, can you tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about what that time in your career was like when you were uh, in those camps? Yeah, so those camps um, I got when I was, I want to say, 17, 18 in the, when I was playing for the Sounders Academy. Um, those camps really opened my eyes to talents overseas, playing against teams like Germany, Finland, um, even Greece, you know, it, it just shows that it doesn't matter where you are, you know, there's talent everywhere and it's a competition everywhere, basically, you know what I'm saying? So it's not like, you know, your job secure and, and just because I'm playing for El Paso and just because I know Hutch and stuff like that, it, my job is secure. No, there's, there's plenty of people all over the country, all over the world that want, if not are looking to take your position. Well, speaking and, oh. of, sorry, go ahead, Christian. Sorry, I, I'm guessing I was probably about to take your question anyways right now, or at least your <laughs> comment. Because um, Mika actually, um, in, in our discussion before the interview, she was talking about how uh, you actually, I think you said that uh, Weston McKinney was in that, uh, in the squad around that time, right, Mika? I don't know, Nick, was he? I th- I think it was. I think he captained a couple of those sides, right? Yeah. The times I went, he wasn't there, but there was other guys like Eric Williamson, um, Jackson Yule, you know, some of some of those guys that played with growing up. You know, I've also played with some of the guys in the U15 national team camp when I went. So, um, yeah, even, even guys like John Lewis that I grew up with that are now, you know, playing for the first team. So, yeah, I know a couple of the guys. So my question is, uh, you know, along those lines of the national team, is is there any interest from the reggae boys to call you up? I mean, Jamaica is really like becoming very stacked. I mean, they've got Mikel Antonio now and, and just mm-hmm. um, Pinnock from, from Brentford, like just a lot of really good players. Have they shown any interest in calling you up? And would you maybe take that on? Well, yeah, I've been trying to see, you know, inch my way into, you know, maybe a camp or, or just, um, see if a scout could come out to a game and yeah, if the opportunity came across, I would definitely take it. Um, it's always good to get international experience, you know, to add under your belt just to make you better all around as a player. Well, let's talk a little bit about your recruitment to El Paso Locomotive, of course. Um, Mm -hmm. How did you learn of Locomotive's interest in you? Obviously, you know, we've talked about how you've got that connection to Hutch, but is it as simple as that? Is he's like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a left back. Are you, are you interested or or how did that come about? Yeah. So before Hutch even got the, the head coach role, when I was with Austin, my head coach at the time was um, Ryan Thompson. And he was telling me that um, that El Paso, you know, just going around the league saying, oh, this team is interested, this team is interested. Because, you know, the team was crashing. You know, he wanted to help out some of the guys that knew that had options. And then, you know, I was, I was weighing out my options in the offseason and what I wanted to do and, you know, speaking to family and stuff like that. And then Hutch contacted me and said, Hey, Nick, listen, look, I want a winger this year. I want you to come play wing for me. Let's, let's figure out the details and, and see where we could go from there. And then I was like, okay, like I'll sit and think about it, you know, and then spoke to family, looked at my other options on, on what was good for me. And I was like, you know what, I just take the opportunity and, and, and make the best of it. So mentioning that time with Bold, obviously you've come up against 
locomotive on the field before at, as mm-hmm. an opposition player. And you've come across quite a few, you know, obviously a lot of the squad is still around that, that you faced. So what are your views of, of the squad and those players that, that have stuck around um, in, in El Paso from the point of view of, of having to had to, you know, defend against them or, or, or play against them? Yeah, at first playing against them, I was like, "Oh, these guys! Like, I hate these guys." You know, <laughs> run all over the place. These guys are too good. Like, I hate. Them. But no, coming here, it's very family oriented. You know, everyone's close and made my transition here very easy. You know, they they welcome everyone new here with open arms, which which is which is what I love. Well, you kind of mentioned this a little bit uh, earlier when you were talking about how you were recruited. Because, you know, Ed Borelli, he's kind of thought of in, in most fans' minds as the starting left back. Um, mm-hmm. how, how do you feel about that healthy competition? Or are John's plans for you really just to play further up the field a, as a winger, which there's competition in those spots too? Yeah, so I think as of right now, um, he's pushing me further up the field to try and, you know, compete for that left wing role. Because like you said, like, looking at my portfolio and stuff, I love to go at players and take people on. And, and obviously I have some um, defending um, history. So when we lose the ball, me defending up, up higher up the pitch is, is also a, a positive. So I think that as right now, you know, I, I think that I'll get pushed up the field, but as you know, anything could change in the season from injuries to, unfortunately COVID and stuff like that, you know, so I'm open to anything at this point. Right. So Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. You're left footed, right? Primarily. Yes. Okay. So I'm kind of curious cause you it's it, lately, at least in the modern game in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of focus on inverted wingers, right? Where the mm-hmm. winger is, is on the opposite side of their footedness if you were playing as a left wing, you'd obviously be on the dominant side. You'd be left footed on the left wing. Do you think that that, like, how would that play? Like, are you good with your, your weaker foot and shooting, or do you like to just go across the keeper cutbacks? Like what, what, how do you like kind of describe your style of play? Yeah. So my style of play, I would describe it as I'm not the type of winger to cut in, all the time and shoot with my right or cut in and then, you know, try and, you know, or cut it back and try and cross over my right and stuff like that. I'm more of the winger that's going to try and take people on, you know, with the mindset of, okay, I'm either going to beat you down the line with my my speed, or I'm going to find a way to shift your body in a way where if I go inside, I could come back out. Or if I go inside, I can, get into the box and either draw a PK or if I have to, I'll shoot my right foot and stuff like that. I'm not saying I never use it. You know what I'm saying? But my main, um, my main goal is to utilize speed and my technique to try and get past people or, or, you know, my change of direction where I trying to, let's say if Vela is a 10 and he's starting, I try and play it into him and then run off of that because it's very hard for, you know, players to continuously track someone that has a lot of speed. In preseason, have you been playing with, uh, with Edder behind you then at left back? How's, or how's that, uh, kind of combination been and who are you kind of finding that you really gel with on the pitch so far? Yeah. So as of right now, um, it's been a mixture between Foxy and, and some Academy boys. Um, but yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever, whoever was playing behind me, I always just try and tell them, you know, it, any communication you give me is just easier for the both of us and what we need to do. So, for sure. So you guys have ha- now have a, a handful of preseason games under your belt, and like you said, you've been you've been kind of playing with a mix of obviously the first teamers, the academy, and and uh, now you've you faced, I, I think 
the Lou City game, if the if the reports are correct, uh, were, was a little bit it got a little bit shaky towards the end. Um, not sure yeah. how the squad uh, shaped up based on I know it was big changes at halftime and all those things. But um, with those games under your belt, how are you feeling about how the squad's coming together under Hutch? And how do you feel about about the team and um, and where you're standing right now with just a, a few weeks to go until until the start of the season? Yeah, so I feel, I'm still feeling pretty confident. Um, the the guys in the locker room, their morale is still pretty high, even after you know that un, un unfortunate result. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're just connecting pieces little by little. Um, obviously, the more games we get, the better off we'll be. So we'll give it to them. We'll give it to Lou City. That you know, okay, kudos to you guys. You know, you guys beat us at one time, but when it truly matters during the season, you, I think they come to us is when we'll show them how, when all, all of our pieces are assembled. You got a, you, I saw you, you actually got a goal in that one the other day too. So congrats to you yeah. on that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Was, um, was yeah, that cutting ahead. in with the right or was that? <laughs> no, 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 no. That was off of a, uh, a Lucho PK. Oh, that's right. The rebound. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. What has Hutch communicated to you all in terms of what the goal is this season? Is it really, you know, have a good regular season, make the playoffs, go all the way? I mean, is he talking long term like that, or is it, you know, one game at a time? Yeah. So we all have the goal to give what give give back to what the fans deserve. Obviously not being part of the squad last year, but seeing what, you know, happened last year that unfortunately ended the season. I, I, I understand where everyone's coming from and they want to give the fans of what they deserve, which is when, when the conference championship, when, when, when the whole league and stuff like that. So we have that in the back of our minds where we want to win. We want to win every single game. We want to make playoffs, We're going to make playoffs, we want to win the the conference title, but we're just taking it game by game because obviously if you think too far ahead, then it's tough to accomplish your short-term goals. Speaking of fans, Nick, I think that's really interesting that you kind of started off talking about them. I know, you know, what's best for you as a player and, and the fit with the club is probably, at, you know, at the forefront of your mind when you were picking your next move. But, mm-hmm. I mean, El Paso is pretty well known around the league for our fan culture. We sell out all our, you know, pretty much every game. It's always a full house. Did that attract you as well? Was that ever in your, your thinking? I mean, we've got the, the famous eighth notch. I don't know if you've seen any of the TIFOs they make. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's a raucous atmosphere. Did that, did that attract you at all? Yeah, of course. It always plays into every professional athlete or professional soccer in this perspective. Um decision on where they want to go firsthand coming here with Tacoma I experienced it and then you know I also experienced it with Austin Bold and it's 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 a different environment you know the fans are loud fans are very supportive they get into the games and and it makes it really hard for anyone any opponent that goes in and tries to play in that stadium so you know, that that also attracted my decision to go and, and play for, you know, the locomotive. Cool. Well, we're um we're we're about finished with, with everything that we've got here, but we've got the, the one uh uh closing up question that, that we ask everyone. We're we're a little bit notorious for it at this point. But um I think you you've probably been in El Paso for for a while now, right? Mm-hmm. You've about a month. Okay, so I don't know how how much of a chance you've had to go around and, and check out the city, but um, we've had some this season in particular. We've had some interesting responses about uh, the El Paso food. Uh, coach really got on us about a uh, portion control, and um, and Emmanuel had a had a local dish that uh, is definitely an acquired taste as as Phil and and Mika can attest to both being yeah. not uh, <laughs> natives here 
But um, have you had anything since you've been here that's really stood out to you, something that you really enjoyed eating? I know you probably got some some Tex-Mex Mexican food in Austin, but we've got real Mexican food in El Paso. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what Emmanuel was talking about, I was actually with him, and I tried it with him as well. <laughs> and it was definitely a different experience of what I've I've been through <laughs> with food. Um but no, there's some, there's some good places out here. When I um, just got out here and I was staying downtown, I visited Taconeta, which is pretty good. It's really good, actually. And then um, when I was with Austin, Austin Bold, we came out here and we found a Jamaican spot, surprisingly, um, up north. And I remember the name of it and I went back out there again. You know, it's pretty good. So, uh, so far, those are the only places that we've been to other than like the traditional Olive Garden and, yeah. and you know stuff like that. I, I'm actually interested. Can you drop the name of that restaurant? I know. I was like, expose <laughs> them, Nick. We need to know who has these terrible rolled tacos. No, no. Well, I'm talking about the Jamaican food. I'm talking about the Jamaican. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because like post receipts. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the Jamaican spot was was it's called Island Vibes. Oh yeah, I think that's yeah. over on Dyer, right? I yeah, it's good. It's yeah. it's near uh I think Fort Bliss. Right. It's near over there. Yeah, it's really good. Really good. Cool. What is your favorite uh Jamaican dish? I I've only ever had like the meat patties, but Yeah. There's you know, obviously I'm Jamaican, I love it all, but um <laughs> the first one I would come to, that comes to mind is oxtail. Oxtail, yep. Okay. Love that. Love that so good is that too heavy for a pregame meal though or is that like yeah. any time i could smash that no it's way too heavy for pregame meal so <laughs> so which <laughs> with jamaican food in in general i think majority of it is pretty heavy so i try and stay away from that before games but after games wow I'll definitely take that down <laughs> <laughs> there you go that's awesome oh uh, well I, I i hope uh i hope we can can recover a little bit from the rolled taco, uh, the, <laughs> the rolled taco experience. Um, and, uh, and Nick pleasure having you on. It was, it was great getting to know you a little bit better. And, uh, we're really looking forward to seeing what you can do this season for us. And, um, I know the, the season's fast approaching, so it, we're not that far away from yeah. talking about games for real now. Yeah, it's getting real close. I think we have what four preseason matches left. Yeah. So, so, yeah. And you guys are going up to Boston, right? Yeah. We found out the news, I think, yesterday or the day before. So, that's, that's exciting. That's really cool. Go up there and smash Can't wait it. to go out there. Yeah, but it's going to be cold, man. I can't. It's be cold. <laughs> well, you're prepared, man. You've got, you've got Ohio experience. He's having flashbacks to Akron. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hope, I hope we play indoor, but. <laughs> no, I'm really, really excited to go up there and, you know, get the experience. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Nick, for spending the time with us. And, uh, and like, like I said, just, uh, yeah, excited, to, excited to see you, um, you know, suit up for locomotive and, and, uh, see what you guys can do this season. Yeah. Can't wait. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, of thanks, course. Nick. Thanks so much. Take care guys. You just heard from Nick Hines, one of the newest members of El Paso Locomotive. And uh, Nick, coming in as an experienced uh, experienced player at this level in USL, he's he's been at S2 slash Defiance. He's been at Austin Bold last season. And it sounds like Hutch has brought him in because he's familiar with what he can bring. And uh, he's asking him to, to be higher up the field as well. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what Nick can bring. And I mean, I'll be honest, we've got a lot of options in, in attacking areas and it's exciting stuff. Really, really exciting. Um, so we are, uh, we're all looking forward to what Nick can add to what is already a, uh, a, a pretty strong attack. So, uh, all that being said, if you have not already. Um, you can find Seriously Loco on any of the major podcast platforms and you can subscribe on any of those. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, uh, at Seriously Loco. And uh, if you so choose and you're like, wow, I want even more of this, we also have a Patreon. Uh, 
Um, so if you can, uh, find us on Patreon, there is actually a handful of articles up on there now, um, outlining and profiling some of our newest players. The last one to go up was the newest signing under Egalus, who is, uh, Mika wrote an awesome article about which you can read up there. Now it's open for patrons and it'll open for free for the rest of everybody else. If you want to consider supporting us, uh, it is two bucks a month um, for the patron bonus content. Um, But uh, all of it comes out from behind the paywall after a couple of days anyways. So if you don't want to do that, totally fine. Um, But if you do check it out and uh, consider supporting us and until next time, Stay loco.